So this is absolutely wonderful. We've got over 100 people, and I can see in the chat that uh, we've got everywhere from uh, Cambridge, hello Georgina, all the way through to Australia and uh, France, hello Nicholas, um, hello Will, um, my goodness, hello Wanri, and from Zurich, oh my goodness, this is wonderful. Well, uh, fantastic. From Marrakesh, all the way from Marrakesh and Ely. Wow, we have we have the world represented here. This is fantastic. Okay, well, a very warm welcome to you all. Um, so uh, we've got uh, hopefully something interesting for you today, and we will be structuring it uh, very simply uh, in a way that hopefully gives you the best chance to engage. We give you um, a nice structure for thinking about some of these issues, and we have a time for questions at the end. So the way we thought we'd do it, and we've learned this from working with our uh, undergraduate students, is that nobody, nobody can concentrate for more than about 20 minutes before, quite understandably, your attention starts to drift. I know mine does. So what we're going to do is have 20 minutes, a little pause, a very short pause, just to stretch your legs and stand up and sit down again if you wish to, another 20 minutes, and then a chance for some questions. And by the way, thank you to all those who've submitted wonderful questions in advance. We'll have a session to come to those at the end. If you do want to ask any questions about anything we're talking about today, then please can you click the Q&A button and type your question in there. And then in the background, we've got Lisa and Ella and Max who are looking at those questions and making sure we, we um, group the ones that perhaps are a bit similar and have a time to answer them at the end. We should also say that we're, it, there is no chance we're going to, gain, to be able to get through all of the questions. So we're setting up a website where we'll be, and after this talk is done, we'll be putting our answers to those questions on that website, and we'll send you an email with a link to that when we're done. And it's lovely that so many of you are just saying hi in the chat um, and to <laughs> giving us such a, an international audience for this talk. So some of us were quite um, sad that normally our Cambridge Festival talk is done in our lovely building and people come along and we can do things face to face. We couldn't do it last year at all, so we're, we're very happy this year to be able to do this online. Um, but we know it's not going to be quite the same, so it's really good if you can be engaging as much as you can and put any questions in the chat so we have a chance to connect with you, particularly at the end. All right, so on we go. The way I thought we'd structure this is to do just two things. We're trying to answer this question is the world's got many very difficult problems at the moment and engineers their job is to try and make things better and what we want to talk about today is just thinking a little bit about how engineers do what they do to make the world a better place so one little challenge we've got today is if you were all in the building with us today we would i'd be able to see that there are some people who are uh, are quite young and some people who are a bit older and I can maybe sort of uh, judge things. I'm afraid I can't see you so I don't know who's here other than now learning that you're from all around the world which is wonderful. Um, so what I'm going to do for some of you you'll go yes 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 we know this move faster and others will be going oh that's interesting can we hear a bit more about that. So I'm trying to target this kind of in the middle so apologies if I go too fast or too slow at any point but do please ask questions in the, at the Q&A session at any point. So what we're going to do is split this into four stories and from those four stories extract three ideas to take away that really hopefully explain a little bit about what it is that engineers actually do to help make the world a better place. So we have uh, four stories structured around things that are happening to us now because of immediate situations, but also things that have been happening over the last few years, or in fact, over the last few decades, or in fact, over the last few centuries. So I'd rather not do this, but let's start with the biggest problem we're facing at the moment. So that is the coronavirus. So I'm not a scientist. I'm not going to talk in detail about anything to do with the, the science and the medicine behind this. I'm just going to highlight one story that relates to how engineers have helped the whole world deal with COVID. And I'm gonna do it as a one specific example that relates to something that happened here in Cambridge. And we know, and have been working with lots of other organizations who've done other great things around the world. This is just one example of one story. 
So there's been a problem. These, this horrible virus has gone around and it's caused such tragedy all around the world. And one of the key things on which uh, things are focused is for many people, the symptoms are very mild. And for some people, the symptoms are very bad. And one of the key issues is that it can affect your breathing. And for some people, this has a, a, a massive problem and people have to be supported to breathe. So what you have is a patient who's suffering from uh, um, uh, something resulting from having the COVID virus, which prevents them from breathing. You need to attach them to a machine, which gives them the support they need, which gives them the the body a chance to rest and let the, let the machine do the, the breathing for them. So these machines are called ventilators. And a year ago, when it wasn't clear how many people were going to be um, uh, suffering from the results of COVID, in the UK, um, they looked around and said, we're going to need some ventilators. How many ventilators have we got in the whole country? And they found 8,000. And that seems like quite a lot to me. Apparently, it was nowhere near enough. They said that they estimated we were going to need about 30,000 of these. So how do you go from 8,000 to 30,000 very, very quickly? And so what happened? Various solutions were tried. Well, the obvious one is to go, we need more ventilators. Let's go and buy some more ventilators. The problem there is that this is a pandemic. It's across the whole world. So everybody's trying to buy ventilators and you just can't find any more to buy. So that wasn't really an option. Next thought is, OK, well, can we go to the firms that make ventilators and say, what can we do to help you make more? Um, and so what they did is they did two, two different things in the UK. One was to say some of the companies making ventilators are quite small companies with not many uh, engineers working there. And they said, well, we can give you lots more engineers, but um, how, do we, how can we train people very quickly? Because a ventilator is a very complex precision piece of engineering and you need specialist skills to learn how to assemble it because if you assemble it wrong, it's completely useless, it's, it's dangerous. So this picture is very interesting. So in this picture, you can see um, someone assembling a ventilator. But what's particularly interesting is two things. One, if you look closely at his T-shirt, it's a bit hard to see, but if you look carefully, you'll see it says Airbus. So here is an engineer who works normally building aeroplanes, is there making ventilators. The second interesting thing is if you look at what's on his head, he's got what's called an augmented reality headset. So he's got a device which is giving him instructions. So another person far away in the ventilator company is sending him instructions, showing him exactly what he needs to do in his glasses. It's projecting the image so he can see it. So he can do exactly what is needed to make that ventilator perfectly, exactly as it needs to be. So they managed to get from a small number of people who can make these up to hundreds and then thousands of people who could help make these ventilators very quickly. And it didn't matter where these people were, they were all around the country, they could all be trained to do the same thing at the same time. So that was a really nice example of engineers thinking a bit differently about how do we solve this problem. Another example was to say, well, we've got ventilators, they're quite difficult to make. Can we build, can we design a ventilator that would be easier to make quickly? That's a bit, that could be rapidly manufacturable. And so a wonderful competition was held and companies such as Dyson, TTP and many others got together and said, can we design a ventilator that's just easier to make and quicker to make in case they are needed? And so amazing things were done there. And there were lots of other companies doing very clever things to provide more ventilators. But what was also interesting was some engineers went, well, it says we need 30,000 ventilators, but actually, if you talk to doctors, they say, we think we might need ventilators for 30,000 patients. That's not quite the same thing. I'll explain what I mean in a second. So if we, here we go, here is the idea that you have one patient, one ventilator, very sensible, very simple. Could you not though say, can't you have one ventilator for two patients? Well, the problem here is, you don't, um, people aren't all the same. So one ventilator doing one thing 
it's very unlikely that both patients are breathing at exactly the same rate and their lungs are going to be different sizes, their, their pulses, their resting pulse will be different, all sorts of problems. So the engineers thought a bit harder and said, but what if we could do something clever between the ventilator and the patients to allow it to, do, to support two patients at the same time? And so they designed one. Here's a picture of it, this active ventilator sharing device. And here's the prototype, they built it. There's our colleague, Duncan McFarlane, and he worked with colleagues, Alan Thorne, Ronan Daly, and a whole bunch of other people, um, both in the engineering department here at Cambridge, but also at the Royal Papworth Hospital. And I'll come back to that in a second. And to show you what it was like, I just wanna show you a short video of, um, from the BBC about what was, how this was um, uh, developed and used to help to address what was thought to be going to be a big problem, which thankfully wasn't such a big problem. Which is where this new device comes in. It's one ventilator, but for two people. You can see clearly here what makes this device unique. So imagine these bellows are human lungs. Now, the one closest to me isn't going up very much at all. So that represents a smaller person with a smaller lung capacity. The far one is going up far more, that's a bigger person with a bigger lung capacity. So one ventilator able to cope with two very different people with very different needs. It's been designed by doctors from Royal Papworth Hospital and engineers from the University of Cambridge. This device allows us to instantaneously double the capacity of the ventilators. So there we have it. Clever engineers working together with doctors. And I want to just extract that last little scene there to show you something very important. And we'll come back to this at the end. Engineers cannot work on their own. There is absolutely no point in an engineer sitting down and feel him or her to just go, I've got the answer, it's this. What you have to do is to really, really understand what the problem is, what the real need and why is it not being addressed at the moment? And this is one of the things we'll come back to at the end. So all the way through this project, you saw engineers and doctors working together, collaborating so that engineers could really, really understand what the problem was before they came up with a solution. And for the doctors to be able to explain how it's going to be used, the people side of technology is so, so, so important. And that's why I wanted to highlight this picture here. So that's one story. We've got about five or six minutes before we go on to the, have a little break, and then go on to the second, the third and fourth stories. So the second story relates to this. So if you remember going back um, just over a year, just under a year rather, in the UK, and I'm, I know this was re replicated elsewhere around the world, we ended up in a situation where supermarket shelves emptied very quickly. And it was dealt with, it was sorted out, but I just want to focus a little bit on this because this uh, shows something very important. There's a difference between what's called panic buying, where people believe something is not going to be available soon, so they buy lots of it now. And that's not the same thing as there being a real shortage of something. We can't get something. And so all the websites and news feeds and social media would talk about how there's, there's, there isn't something in the shops anymore. And this led to lots of panic and people buying lots and lots of things from uh, pasta, rice, sugar, flour, and toilet rolls were a big thing for some reason. Um, and these were panic buying. There, were, there was plenty of supply, but people felt they needed to buy lots of it now, suddenly, which is different from the fact that we were short of some things. Some things were not available, and particularly in hospitals and care homes and the whole healthcare system, there was not enough personal protective equipment, PPE, and that was a real shortage. There wasn't panic buying, there was a real shortage of that because more was needed than was expected. So if we just step back for a second and look at what this problem really is about, this is what engineers have to do. They have to go back and go, what, what, what's the problem here? So this is an issue of what's called supply chains. So this is where you connect all the bits from digging stuff out the ground and processing it all the way through to building little bits, to building bigger bits, to building the thing you want, to the thing you buy. And if we use that simple example of a toilet roll, it's kind of interesting because you go, well, it's a roll of paper. It's made in a rolling mill. You process something that's come out of a tree and you've pulped it up and you make rolls of paper and you send them to the shops and people buy them. 
And it's pretty clear how much is going to be needed. It doesn't change dramatically very much. Um, and so when we saw panic buying, this was quite difficult for companies because they said, but there's plenty. We just weren't expecting it all to be needed right now. So we, we, do we start making lots more? Because then in a few weeks, people won't need so much and then we'll have too much left over. And that, well, we've got to, that's not good either. So there's something very interesting about how supply and demand works when people start to panic. So that was one issue. How do you balance supply and demand? And that was solved fairly quickly by just um, increasing demand temporarily and then going back, uh, sorry, increasing supply temporarily and then going backwards to where you were before. But supply chains aren't really quite that simple. If you think of, this is a, another, a simple version of a complex story. If this is a, a mobile phone, and a mobile phone is made up of lots of bits, and typically they're made in lots of different factories, and they're brought together and assembled, and then shipped somewhere, perhaps via train, put in boxes, put on trains, put on ships, taken off the ships, put on trucks, taken to maybe a warehouse or somewhere where you collect them all together before you ship them off to different parts of the country, and then they go in other trucks, and they finally go to you where you get your phone. And that, that chain is quite complicated. But this is a very simple picture of a complicated story. And I just want to show you how complicated it can get and why this then causes problems. And you'll be able to see why this causes problems when we have a, a pandemic or, I don't know, something gets stuck in the Suez Canal. So the reality is, even if you have a product that's quite simple, a lettuce, okay? You grow it in a field, you, you chop it, you sell it, you eat it. Shouldn't think that would be very complicated. But the supply chain for lettuce, just to illustrate that even simple things are complicated, is this. So this is from my colleague uh, Mukesh Kumar and some of his team have been looking at the supply of lettuce, which again should sound very, very simple, is actually very complicated because you've got, got lots of farms who then have to grow and harvest all their crops. They have to then clean it and get it chilled to the right temperature so it will survive longer. And there are lots and lots of people doing chilling. Then you need to bring it all together to make sure you've got the right lettuces in the right parts of the country at the right time. And it may even have come from overseas. You can see there's a um, one of the examples here is coming from Spain into the UK. It's got to cross borders and cross the sea and all sorts of things. You've then got to make sure the right so that the, the restaurants get what they want, the supermarkets get what they want, the companies that process lettuce into salads that you buy in a supermarket. So an extra step is done to get to the shops to get to you to eat. So even something as simple as a lettuce gets quite complicated. But what if it's not a simple thing like a lettuce? What if it's something a bit more complicated like a car? So just look at this picture. Every one of those parts or groups of parts will have been made somewhere, possibly anywhere in the world. So you've got not just one or two companies, You've got dozens, hundreds, in some cases, thousands of companies across the world, all needing to provide things to each other to make all the bits that need to be put together to make a car. This gets very complicated. And just to show you how complicated it gets, if you try and draw a little picture, as I did before, of a straight line of a supply chain, you can't draw it for the car sector or the aeroplane sector. So you end up with pictures that look quite different pictures that look quite beautiful. So I'm very grateful to our colleague, Alexandra Brintrup, who does this, where she, she tries to map out what's going on with all the different companies who make all of these parts to make a car. And you end up with pictures that look like this, or like this, where every one of those dots is a company providing something that's been put into another company, to another company, to end up as a part in your car. Incredibly complicated. The miracle is that it works at all. And it is fantastic that we have these extraordinarily complex networks of lots of people with lots of companies doing lots of things, all coordinated, all like a, an orchestra at work spread across the whole world. But sometimes it gets, it doesn't quite work. And if we just pick out this little point here about ships, because that uh, in the last couple of weeks, we've seen an example of what happens when one bit of these complex pictures goes wrong when you can't move from one factory to another factory because something happens. But it is worth just having a look at how beautiful, like a, like a ballet it is when container ships are doing their jobs properly. So here we have a big container ship being unloaded. 
And you have this, this is happening 24 hours a day all around the world. This incredible loading and offloading of containers off these enormous ships. You see something, it, it's quite beautiful and it's, it's coordinated, it's synchronized, it works. So inside every one of those containers is a whole series of boxes of bits of things that need to be somewhere else or finished products coming to your house from all around the world. So this incredible thing is happening. And then suddenly something like this happens, this container ship that got stuck in the Suez Canal. So all of those hundreds of containers were urgently needed somewhere and they couldn't get through. And then also all of the ships waiting behind them couldn't get through. And so this beautiful model broke down. And the only alternative until they moved that ship was to take a much, much longer journey right the way around um, Africa to reach the UK if you're coming from China. So incredible problem from one, one small link in that chain. So I just want to get to one more thing and then we'll have our little pause. It's very complicated what's going on and things can easily go wrong. The other problem is that the distance between the dots can be very, very far indeed. And so what we see is that when we had the, the problem with this protective equipment not arriving in different countries, part of the problem was there was a very, very long distance between where the equipment was being made and where it was needed. So then someone suggested, why don't we just stop shipping things for thousands of miles and make things much more local. Why don't we make things where they're needed? In other words, put the factory exact, much, much closer to where it's needed. And this is exactly what we saw happening. This is what engineers helped sort out very, very, very quickly. So we saw lots of companies who make different things, in, in this case, in the UK, changing what they did very quickly from making um, outdoor wear to making scrubs, from making industrial equipment into making face masks, from making um, awards for TV shows into making face shields. They did this very, very quickly. So suddenly the 10,000 mile problem disappeared. And we also saw great organizations like these uh, university research labs that weren't being used, community make spaces like this in Cambridge, where they made on a voluntary basis, they just started making supplies for the hospitals. They started making things locally and then really, really helpfully giving instructions to explain to other people how do you make things that would help the hospital. So you made everything much, much more local. OK, what I'd like to do now is we've done the first two stories. We've seen how the ventilator sharing device was developed. And we've seen how supply chains get very complicated, but how you can make them much simpler, much quicker. This is what engineers are very good at. I'd like you now just to take a one minute break. So wherever you are, if you can, just pause, get up, walk around in a circle, come back and we'll start again in one minute, please. Or maybe you wish to use this time to put any questions you have into the chat. But I'm just gonna start the clock. We're gonna have a 60 second break now just to let you collect your thoughts. I'm just gonna turn my camera off so you can know that I'm also taking a one minute break. Okay, see you in 59 seconds. And we're back. So I hope you had uh, a chance to stretch your legs or, oh, I see there's more questions coming in. Oh, that's, that's wonderful. Oh my goodness, so many excellent questions. All right, so what I'm going to do now is carry on with the next two stories, and then we'll go to the three key points to take away from those four stories, and then we'll go to the Q&A session. So, uh, right, let's carry on. The next thing is thinking about long distances. So we talked about the, the 10,000 mile 
issue with supply chains for um, uh, protective equipment and some electronics and things like that and cars. That's quite a long way. 10,000 miles strikes me as quite a long way. But what if the distance is a bit bigger? What if it's 40 million miles, which is the distance between the Earth and Mars? So I don't think I'm ever going to go to Mars. Some of you may. But you'll be encouraged to know that there's a lot of planning going on for how we could actually get to Mars and how we could develop um, the ability to survive on Mars. But one of the biggest problems is it's 40 million miles away. That takes seven months to travel there. So whatever you're going to do, there's not only the problem of thinking, how do we get stuff, anything you need, you're going to have a seven month waiting before you get it. It's going to travel 40 million miles. The other thing is on that journey of seven months, you're going to need things. Things will go wrong. You're going to need um, repairs done to your equipment. All sorts of problems will occur along the way. And they can't, once you're moving on your 40 million mile journey, you can't stop at a service station, you can't pop into a garage, it's not like a plane where it can land if it needs something in an emergency, it's got to keep going. So the solution that engineers have come up with is take the factory with you, take the ability to make things along the journey with you. And we'll talk about two examples of this. So one of the ways they're thinking about this is using 3D printers. So many of you will know exactly what a 3D printer is, but for those who are less familiar, here's a quick picture a quick video of what a 3D printer does. So there are many different types of printer. Here's the simplest one. So it's literally um, making an object. It only puts the material exactly where it's needed. So you can make any shape you like. Um, and that's quite a useful thing. You don't need to have a machine that makes just one thing. It can make almost anything. And so what we see is they've taken, as a way of preparing for the journey to Mars, They've made 3D printers that are good to use in space, and they've taken them up to the International Space Station, which is like a, a staging post for the 40 million mile journey. And they're testing it. And so they've got uh, Samantha Cristoforetti here is installing the 3D printer to make sure it works. And here's one of the other astronauts who's produced a simple thing, but a very important thing. So if you need to have a special tool to do something, and you realize you didn't bring it with you, no problem, you can make it using the 3D printer. So they're getting really good at the idea of whatever you need, we can make it, we've got the factory with us to make the thing we need. What's also very encouraging is they're also installing machines for recycling of things they make, because they know that we've got, they've got to, they can't take lots and lots of material with them because that's also very heavy and expensive. So what do you do? You take machines that recycle the things you don't need and that material can then be used in the 3D printer to make new things, which is, which is very clever. The other thing is they're using 3D printers or they're planning to use 3D printers for when they arrive to say, can we build a habitat? So you can't take you know, tons of bricks and concrete and stuff out with you 40 million miles. Instead, you find ways to build with what's there. And one of the best ways of building with material that's available in a quick way is to use a 3D printer. So these are the sort of habitats, houses, they imagine they could build on Mars with a giant 3D printer. So now I'd like to show you a short video, and I'll put a link to the longer video on the website, about how they had a competition to come up with the best 3D printer that could be used on Mars. Right now, you're looking at renderings of human settlements on Mars. These designs were part of NASA's 3D printed habitat challenge, a four year long competition aimed at engineering homes for another planet. The brightest architects and engineers from across the globe put their skills to the test, culminating this year in a nail-biting finale. Two teams went head-to-head -to, -head to print their designs live in front of NASA judges. Hey, keep going, keep going, keep going. Hey. Fine to prove they have what it takes to build humanity's home on Mars. So, that's another way they're using 3D printers. You take not just the factory to support the things you need on the journey, but a factory to then build the thing you need to live on, on this other planet. Right now. Oh, was, right. Sorry about that. Um, the other issue is that, well, it's very exciting talking about Mars and what we might do 40 million miles away in a few years' time, but what about back on Earth? Does any of that technology make sense for what we do now? Well. Yes, the engineers working on 3D printing have done some extraordinary things that are changing our lives now and will change our lives in the future. So 
again, just for those who may not have seen it before, this is how you make a car at the moment. Okay, it's a, a process that's been fairly standard for the last half century, although using more robots than before. But the basic idea, bits of metal come flying along and they're pressed into the right shape to make a car. Um, and what you want to do, because these machines are very expensive, is to make every single car as similar as possible. You don't want lots of variety. So cars end up looking very similar. So this video, I'm just going to jump through a few bits. You can see a, a big feature of car manufacturing is things are quite big and uh, you need a lot of energy to change the shape of this metal into the shape of doors, body panels, bonnets, all of these things. And you want them all to be as similar as possible because it's much cheaper to make the same thing over and over again, rather than making lots of different things. So, and you can see, I can also share this video. It's wonderful. There's lots of robots involved and you can see as similar as possible. You don't want much variety, which is fine. But what if you want a car that doesn't look like all the other cars? Well, that's quite difficult and gets quite expensive. And yet, thinking back to that video about what we're going to do as we head towards Mars, look at this video. So this is not a model of a car on a 3D printer. This is a full size car, 3D printed. You can see uh, it's, it's uh, not the smoothest surface finish um, and it's got some little problems with it. But it's an illustration, it's an example of how we might be able to build cars in the future. And the most exciting bit about this is that you, you only get the thing you want. You don't produce lots of cars and hope people buy them. You produce exactly the car the person says they want, which means there's probably less waste. And the other thing is you can have these machines locally. You don't have to have a big factory which is kept far away because it needs to be near um, certain certain things it needs, you can have lots of little factories spread around locally, which could be very, very good for all sorts of reasons. The other thing we see is companies providing more what's called personalization, more customization. So there's this very interesting company, there are many like this uh, emerging at the moment, doing very clever things with 3D printers. So if I just start off this video, and just listen to what they're saying as they talk through this. I'll, I will jump through it a little bit, um, but I want you to just hear a couple of bits here. Welcome to Carbon. We're a technology company changing the way the world makes things, specifically 3D printed things. We didn't start out trying to change manufacturing forever. We didn't? No, we didn't. We started with the simple goal of making 3D printed parts better. It's 25 to 100 times faster, which is game changing. But we quickly realized that with our combination of technology and materials, we could make real parts with mechanical properties and surface finishes that make injection molded plastics obsolete by comparison. Embracing the idea that speed to production isn't an obstacle anymore the only way forward. And our partners share our enthusiasm for reinventing the rules. Partners who are manufacturing at scale, making millions of real products. Like us? Yeah, like you. In partnership with Adidas, we've created a midsole that shouldn't exist so that they could make a shoe that shouldn't exist. Light, super flexible, highly durable, and printed straight from liquid. A marvel of design and function, this shoe defies logic. And whether you want to make one or one million, this is true, customizable, and on-demand mass manufacturing. This is not a publicity stunt. This is a revolution. Okay, so we'll, there's a lot of enthusiasm for the, uh, this technology. But what you can see is this is very interesting because it means that rather than making lots of shoes exactly the same, you make shoes that are individually designed for each person so they fit perfectly. The other thing you'll have seen is that the printer is actually quite small. So you could have these printers located much closer to you. So you don't have to transport the shoes so far around the world. You can make them locally. So there are lots of interesting things coming about as a result of 3D printing. So one, two, three stories. We've got one more to go before we bring things together with our common themes and then to the questions. And by the way, thank you so much for all the questions that are coming in. Um, we'll do our best to get through uh, a few of these, but I suspect we'll need to put the answers up on the website. There's a lot of questions now. 
So the final one is dealing with the biggest problem of all, which is how do we ensure that this planet remains habitable, not just for us, but for future generations as well. And there's lots of things we could talk about here, and there are lots of things that engineers are doing to try and ensure we have a, a healthy planet for the future. And one key thing all the way through this is, is reducing the level of emissions we make that are causing problems with warming the planet, which causes all sorts of other problems that you'll be very familiar with. And one of the areas in which emissions uh, arise comes from the fact that we are, the way we transport things, the way we move ourselves, the way we move things around generates a lot of emissions, which cause some of these problems. So if we just pick one um, particular example, you can go, well, wouldn't it be great if we just switched to electric vehicles rather than petrol or diesel cars? Which of course is happening rather slowly, but it is it's accelerating now. But what's interesting is that electric vehicles are not new. We had them over a hundred years ago, but they weren't used that much. And again, I can't see the audience. I don't know how old you all are, but for people of my generation and above, when you think of electric vehicles, we probably think of this. We think of the milk float, very slow, not very um, elegant vehicle that, that did its job well. It delivered milk to your house and they were very quiet, but they were very slow and they needed a long time to charge. And look what's happened now though. Now we have, a huge number of electric or hybrid vehicles reaching the market. So this is the, what's this one? This is a Porsche, I think, of some sort. You know, it's, it's, we've had a hundred years to do this. And we're only now doing it. And so what I want to uh, uh, highlight here is there's a reason why these things take a long time, even though they're, they've got some problems. We'll come to that later, but it's a good thing to do. It's a helpful thing to do. And the problem is it's not just about designing the car. That's a nice car, whatever that is, the uh, Tesla Model 3. The issue is, yes, you can design a very elegant and high performance um, electric car. But you also need to have the ability to make them. So here is the Tesla factory in China. So you need the ability to, if you want people to use them, you've got to make lots of them. And if, if you don't make very many, they're going to be very expensive. If you can make lots, you can make them cheaper. So you've got to put all this investment into new factories because the way you make an electric car is somewhat different from a regular car. Um, and so you, you need this, you need these factories built or old factories converted to make electric cars. Again, I could watch this for hours, but um, I'll put that on the website. The other thing is, it's not just about the car and building the car. It's also about the fact that you need the batteries, the biggest technological thing in an electric car, the batteries. You've got to have factories then that make the batteries. So again, you start off with lots of individual cells. You've got to make millions of these little cells and they've all got to be perfect and they're connected together to make a big battery pack like that, which is then assembled into the car. And you need very big factories to do this. If you want this to happen in a way that is um, cost effective and really makes an impact, you need factories that are huge. You need what they're calling gigafactories. And here's an example of one. Just look how big that is. If you look at the size of the cars in the car park, that is a huge factory. Um, and it's just making the batteries for one uh, range of cars. You need this huge investment to build the factories. You also need, of course, that once you've got the cars out there, it's not much good if you can't charge them. So you need all of the infrastructure for charging across the world to be sorted out. And of course, at the moment, there, there are many more charging points than there used to be. But it's still, if you have an electric car, you've got to plan your journey quite carefully to make sure you can charge it. So that's why things like ZapMap have appeared, where you get in your electric car and you say, I'm going on this journey. Where are the charging points along the way? So you see, all of this has to be in place. And of course, as many of you will, will point out, I'm sure, there's no point having electric vehicles if the electricity is then coming from coal-fired or gas-fired power stations to generate electricity. All you've done there is move the pollution from your car back to a big factory. So you've also got to have the whole infrastructure of renewable energy there as well. So all of this has to happen. All of this has to come together. This whole system has to be created. It's not just about the cars, it's about the batteries, it's about the charging, it's about the energy supply. Everything has to happen together. And this is what engineers have to think about, these system problems. So 
But there are many other bits of transport that we um, use in our daily lives or in our annual lives. So it's we're thinking about this from engineers are thinking about this from cars, but also in terms of um, transport of goods uh, around the world, but also not just on land. And they're also thinking hard about how do you make ships more efficient, but also aircraft. And, you know, at the moment, the um, aircraft industry is very much based around this. So these beautiful highly efficient bits of technology, this, this jet engine attached to a A380 over there, they are very refined. They've had 70 plus years to get these uh, jet engines working as effectively as they, there's always room for improvement. They've done amazing things, but they're still burning fossil fuels. They're still emitting gases which are causing problems. And yet we have a whole industry of all of the engine makers, all the aircraft manufacturers, all working together, and they do uh, an incredible task of building aircraft that are so, so, so much more efficient than they used to be. But people have said, yes, but they're still gas turbines. They still shoot, they burn fuels and they, they give emissions out. Why not move to electric planes? Well, they are. The trouble is that's the biggest, I believe, the biggest electric aircraft in the world. So you can make them. They don't have a very long range and they, they're still at the moment quite small because they do, the, the weight, the problem with the, the weight and the power means you can't have very large electric aircraft yet. So again, engineers could go, well, that's, that's just in the too difficult category. We can't do that. But of course, they never say that. They say, well, let's test a lot of ideas on these smaller aircraft and then start bringing in electric engines. So you have hybrid aircraft. You have one electric engine amongst the other engines. So you reduce the need for jet engines um, that burn fuel and actually have fans that are powered by electricity. But again, you don't do it all in one giant step. You do it in steps as the system needs to change. And then in the future, yes, we probably will have fully electric aircraft, aircraft that are um, zero emission. So the idea of fly zero, they talk about, it has no emissions when it's flying. But to do that, that's, that's a lot of technologies have to come together to do that. But this is what engineers need to do. They can't just say, well, that's very difficult and far away. Let's go right the way back to think about how we make all of the components, all of the bits of our aircraft industry more efficient and then aim to have this zero emission vehicle in the future. So there we go, four stories that illustrate how engineers are helping to manufacture a better world. We've gone from the uh, activities that have been done specifically to address an urgent and critical medical need. We've talked about the ways in which um, our daily lives uh, operate in an extraordinary way. For, for many of us, we have no idea of the complexity of the supply chains that are at work all the time because they just work. They are invisible to us. We only spot a problem when there's a, a crisis, when something goes wrong in those complex supply chains, then it has an instant effect. So engineers are working really hard to try and simplify things, to avoid this complexity, to avoid this weakness that means that one little thing, such as um, an, uh, uh, a ship blocking the Suez Canal, doesn't have this huge effect, or when there's a sudden surge in demand, as there was for protective equipment, we can cope with it. We can adjust and maybe make things more locally. They don't have to travel thousands of miles. And then the third story looked at the issue of, well, if we just extend from a few thousand miles to a few million miles, this is a great way of testing out technologies that are much more efficient, that allow us to live our lives differently. And one of those technologies is 3D printing. There's lots of good things it can do and lots of things that still need to be developed. But it's a great technology that, and the space exploration illustrates how this can be used. And then finally, the fourth story was making this point about the planet has got limited resources and it's, it's got problems at the moment because we, it, we burn too much stuff that emits too much pollution, which causes problems. So how can we accelerate the process of reducing the amount of stuff we burn and using the example of transport as part of that? But making this key point that it's not just about having electric cars, engineers have to think about the whole system to make that work. So three ideas from the four stories. Here are the three ideas. If we just look at each of those stories there, there's lots of things we can extract from them. And I can see from the questions that lots of great, great points are being raised. The first thing to take away from this is 
good engineers, if they want to make a difference, they have to really understand what the problem is. Never assume you just know, ah, I've understood that, it's fine. You have to talk to people, you have to ask lots of questions. And looking in the chat, I can see we have some younger members of the uh, audience here, which is great. So again, sometimes um, uh, you should always ask why and why not. Sometimes perhaps it can be asked too many times, but generally asking why and why not is a very useful skill because it forces people to think very hard about what's going on. Asking why and why not is really, really important because if you don't understand the problem, you're going to come up with the wrong solution. And that's very, very clear. So number one is always be asking questions to understand the problem. And another point related to that is, remember I showed you the picture of the doctor and the engineer together. Don't, if you're an engineer, you don't just ask other engineers. You go to the people who've got the problem so they can explain what the problem really is. Don't assume you know what the answer is. Engineers ask questions. The other thing I've mentioned several times in these four stories is it's got to be about the whole system. You can't just think about one little bit and fix that and think it's all fine. You've got to think about the whole system. And it's always about people and technology. If you just think about technology, which is very, very important, you're then going to miss something out if you don't also focus on the human, the people side of it. How are people using this technology? How are people going to use this technology? How do people need to change their behavior to make this thing happen? You need to back to question point one. You've got to ask the question. You've got to engage with people at all stages. And thirdly, and finally, you've got to be able to complete the whole job. It's not good enough. An engineer isn't a good engineer if they just come up with a solution and don't do anything about it. And so just to close off, if I may, I have this wonderful, I'm very lucky, I have this wonderful job title, which is the Dr. John C. Taylor Professor of Innovation. And Dr. John C. Taylor is an extraordinary man. And I'm mentioning him here because he illustrates perfectly point three, this third point here. So this is the thing that Dr. John C. Taylor has become very famous for. This is the inside of your electric kettle. Okay, so he came up with the technology that makes your kettle switch off when the water boils. And the reason I mention him is he didn't just come up with that idea and go, that's a clever idea, I've solved the problem. He went all the way through, he built the machines that make the little bits of metal here that make the kettle switch off. He designed the whole system with his team of engineers and went all the way through to a complete solution which now sits in your house, in your kettle, every day, one billion of these switches are being used at any one time. Quite, quite extraordinary. And that's what engineers have to do. They can't just have an idea. They've got to go all the way through to the solution. OK, thank you very much for listening. I'm now going to switch to the questions. And again, if you want to know more immediately about what we do at the Institute for Manufacturing, just search for IFM Cambridge. But we've had a whole bunch of questions coming in. So I think I'm going to just quickly check. Um, my colleague Max has been very helpful in um, um, pointing out the uh, some great questions coming in, particularly to do with recycling. Um, oh, and a lot about 3D printing. OK, so we have 45 questions have been posed in the chat, and there's another about 20 were sent in advance. There is no chance in our final 10 minutes we're going to be able to cover these. So I'm just going to pick out a couple, if I may. So there's one question there about um, materials that can be used for 3D printing. So I've shown you two examples. I showed you bits of plastic being made, and I showed bits of uh, concrete or, or um, a building material being used. Are those the only two materials you can use for 3D printing? Absolutely not. The materials that can be used at the moment are with different types of 3D printer are metals. There's a lot of work on metal components where you have lots of powder and you use lasers to 3D print things. We also have examples of um, ceramics being used. So if you want to make a component that's, that's very strong in very high temperatures, that's got a very complex shape, you can 3D print with ceramics. We also see 3D printed food um, coming along, um, quite simple at the moment, but can becoming more advanced. We also see um, the, an indication that in the future, we'll be able to 3D print human tissue. So if you want to um, 
uh, if someone's had a bad burn, you need some new skin at the moment, they take skin off one part of your body and apply it to where you've been burned. Well, what if you could make artificial skin? One of the technologies that could help with that is 3D printing. So there's a whole lot of questions about 3D printing that I'd be happy to answer. So I'm just looking down at my phone here to see all the ones that have come in. Um, there was a, if I just jump to some, there's a lot of questions about PPE and the details of the supply of protective equipment to hospitals. So if I may, I'm gonna answer a couple more questions about 3D printing and a couple of questions about personal protective equipment and then some of the other questions about sustainability that have come in. So one of the issues around, we'll just finish off on 3D printing, is around recyclability. If you've made something with a 3D printer, don't they just encourage you to make more things that you don't need? And yes, that, that is a concern. So what we need to get much better at is understanding what it is that people really want and producing the thing that they want that lasts, that endures, that is strong and reliable. One of the worries they have with 3D printers, particularly those that make plastic um, items, is it encourages people to just make more stuff, make even more things that cause more pollution, particularly if they're made of plastic. So two things. One is you can recycle the plastic, so it's not as bad as it sounds. The other thing is really focusing on making higher quality products and saying it's not just a quick thing you want to make, it's a better thing you're making. So the idea that it's quick and easy is not the issue. It should be making the better thing, the thing you really want, the thing that you really need, the thing that's most useful. And what's most encouraging is seeing how 3D printing is used in the medical world for various technologies that are wearable, that attach to your body or replace a limb if you've lost one. That's a really good use of 3D printing. There's lots and lots more questions on 3D printing. If I just go on though to the protective equipment. So one of the comments made was, um, was there actually enough protective equipment? Was it just in the wrong place? And the related question was about, is it because we suddenly started using more um, when it wasn't clear it was needed? So this is a very difficult question to answer. So at the beginning of the pandemic, it was perhaps assumed that the only people who needed the full protection and protective equipment would be those dealing directly with patients who had COVID. Very quickly it became clear that you needed everybody to be protected in the healthcare system. So not just those in intensive care units, but all doctors and nurses, and then those in GP surgeries, and then those in pharmacies, and those in care homes, everybody needed equipment. So demand for the equipment did go up dramatically. And so it wasn't just a panic, it was a genuine increased need. And of course, that takes a long time to correct for. How do you how do you find the time? How do you find the capacity to suddenly make more stuff? And that's why it was so interesting that local companies said, this is needed. We have equipment that is not meant for this, but we can adjust the equipment. We can retrain our workers to make the new thing. So it was about dealing with an increase in demand, a genuine increase in demand, when the, the factories overseas that were making most of this equipment could not cope. They couldn't make enough stuff. And it was 10,000 miles away, so it took a while to actually get here. So there's a lot of questions also about the details of the ventilator sharing device. So for that one, what I'm going to do is, it's not my specialist area, I don't want to give any incorrect information. Our colleagues, uh, particularly uh, Ronan Daly, Duncan McFarlane and others, have made a great video explaining in detail what they did. We'll post that video on the website for this talk as well. Um, if I just pick out other ones that have come in as well, uh, da, 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 da. Um, uh, yes, combining two things, there was about, as we get to the sustainability one, asking about can we 3D print electric cars? Absolutely. It's a slightly, it's dealing with a different problem, but it's dealing with the same issue that people don't all want cars that look exactly the same. We'd like to customize them. The problem with one of the many problems of 3D printing cars is a petrol or diesel powered car is very complicated. It's got lots and lots of moving parts. It's just, it's very complicated. An electric car mechanically is much simpler. Batteries, motors, wheels, brakes, and the interior and the electronics. It's a much simpler approach to making a car. So actually it's quite likely that we will see customized electric 3D printed cars arriving, but not yet. Um, because we've still got to refine all the technologies for all the, um, the systems that make the car run. 
Um, so moving on to the sustainability questions that are coming in, issues around um, recyclability. Can you reuse materials in 3D printers? Absolutely. There were questions coming in about um, uh, the way in which you, you, you still use a lot of energy to make batteries, you still use a, and resources to make batteries, and you still use a lot of energy to make the car, even though it might be more efficient once it's running. So this is a very interesting uh, and complicated question about where is the impact of what you make? So it's no good just making a car that's beautifully efficient and doesn't emit any gases at the end. You've also got to understand how it was made and how it's run. So the example being, there's no point having an electric car saying, oh, it's zero emission. If you've used huge amounts of fossil fuels and minerals to build the car and huge amounts of energy, and then the electricity you're using is coming from an oil fired or a gas fired or a coal fired um, uh, power station. You've got to think about that whole system problem. And it's quite complicated how that works, but we're getting towards um, a clearer view of the real impact of electric vehicles. So heading towards the last couple of minutes. I'm just going to pop up the questions here and just see if Max is encouraging me to answer any other particular ones. Uh, um, right, a uh, very good one on the um, uh, manufacturing side is we've talked a lot about making and minimizing the impact of making and then making sure you've got the right products, so you keep it for longer, but people are also asking very sensibly, what about the end of life? However good the product is, you're going to need to recycle it. And if you've made it, if you've made an electric vehicle, can you recycle electric cars? Can you recycle batteries? Can you, if you've made something with lots of complex materials that have been 3D printed, how easy is it going to be to recycle that? So again, we have a link that can explain more about that. Um, and we'll post that uh, on the website. And again, if I just have a quick scroll through, um, yes, um, very, very good points being made here. We've covered some of these about, of course, the energy required to make the materials that go into a 3D printer mean that overall you may be consuming more energy. But I'll come back to the point that says, but if you're making the right thing and it lasts longer, that may be much better. Uh, if I just go through, well, some X, oh my goodness, so many good questions here. Um, so to answer one question, can you 3D print uh, body parts? Yes. It's quite difficult because the process of printing is quite um, violent in some ways. So you're either heating things up and squirting them out of a tube, or you're using a laser to melt things. So clearly things with lasers and melting, you can't use on human cells because it would just kill them. But even when you're squirting things out of a tube, a human cell is very, very, very clever. But when you're squirting it at high speed and it's whizzing out of a nozzle and hitting a surface, it's very likely you will damage the cell and possibly kill it. So you can print the shape of the, the thing you want to build with human cells, but it may not survive, the, the skin may die. So how do you find ways to ensure that the cells can be deposited, can be printed in a way that doesn't damage them? That was a question uh, being asked by uh, uh, Nicer Valentine. Um, well, yes, lots of good questions about why do electric vehicles run out of power so quickly? We need better batteries. We need a lot more research on battery technologies. And without overselling the Institute for Manufacturing here, we're doing some work on rapidly charging batteries. So you either try and make them last longer, which is very important. You also want to speed up the way you can recharge them. And some work is happening there. OK, I, I will, we, not just me, we will do our best to consolidate these great, great, great questions you've put up. Thank you so much. And so nice to see so many schools represented here in the audience, that's wonderful. We will collect these questions, we will put up our best answers and we'll put them on our website and we'll then email you with any questions that we can possibly answer and also link you to some nice videos that we showed today in longer form, but also some videos of other things we think you'll find interesting. So I'm afraid the time is up. I know you'll have other things to get to now. So thank you very, very much for joining today. I'm so pleased we had such a great turnout and so many people stayed all the way through. Thank you so, so much for all your questions. As I said, we'll do our best to answer them um, um, on our website. And if you want to know any more about the work we do or anything about engineers and how they manufacture a better world, please, please have a look at our website. But for now, thank you very much for your time and attention. Hope you have a good Easter break 
and uh, best wishes for the rest of today and the rest of this uh, this year where things are going to get better. Thank you very much. Bye for now.